have a special guest up here. Um, you've seen on the news all week about Hurricane Michael. Well, Mike, um, <laughs> uh, member of this church, and uh, in fact, helped us get contemporary worship started 24 years ago, raised his kids with my kids and some of your kids all the way through the youth group. Uh, his kids got married here and uh, been a part of this church for a long time. He happened to have moved just a little while ago up to Panama City and comes firsthand to tell us, um, we're going to, at the end of his talk, we're going to talk about what we can do, but let's hear firsthand how it was like to be up in Panama City. Mike? Good, Good morning. This is not about me. And it's not about my family, but I have to start there to, to paint the picture. So please bear with me a little bit, and we will get to the real reason I'm here. And I thank you for your patience, and I apologize for my tears and your tears, which I suspect will flow. Um, we moved up seven weeks ago. We lived in Bradenton for 15 years after being here and loving the building of this church and watching it grow to what it is today, and I thank you for being part of that. Uh, I know this this uh, church and the people that it draws and, and the heart that it has. And Jack and I talked yesterday, he's helping me heal and uh, certainly knows the story. We had a hurricane come upon us that 24 hours prior to it we thought would be a, an inconvenience. And 12 hours before it hurt it would be a category three. And by the time we thought we would escape from it, it was too late, the gas was gone, and which mon many of you did not know and the roads were already pretty well blocked. We didn't have a way out. I helped board up my, my family's uh, house. We knew it was high enough, so we weren't worried about a storm surge. We weren't close to the beach. I lived, in an, I lived with my wife in an apartment that we knew was safe. We're in a, a safe part of the community, and we knew we would ride it out. And my family stayed in their home, and I stayed with my wife in our apartment. And by the time we heard it was hitting, it was certainly a very strong Category 4, fearful to be a Category 5, and we prayed that it would turn enough that it wouldn't damage us. Well, we were very wrong. Uh, we watched for about two and a half hours. Well, the two and a half acres of about 150 to 200 trees, the very mature trees, broke in front of our eyes. Uh, we watched them topple or break in half. We heard winds that were unbearably loud. We watched rains that were blinding. Now, mind you, our windows are recessed four feet back from the sides of the building. And the rain hit so hard you could not see out. Can you only imagine? You've seen the pictures from uh, Puerto Rico and, and Homestead and the areas that have been devastated, and we are all affected by those, and those are very tragic. And, and, uh, and ours is no different or no worse. And uh, during this time, communications are lost and you're seeing the tragedy as it unfolds and it's like watching a train wreck you can't turn away and you're certainly praying a lot and, and I am a God-fearing soul and I, I love God and, and I know I'm in good hands and you're hoping the best for your neighbors and the people you're just getting to know and, and certainly you're praying for your family nearby and uh, the storm begins to subside and you manage to creep out to the hallway which is our doorway was in, enclosed very safe and I was able to peek around the corners, although the wind was bad enough I couldn't physically get out and look left and right and realize that it was much more tragic than I even knew. And eventually got to the edges of the hallways and saw just how bad it really was. And two to three hours later, I managed to get a text message through, which surprised the heck out of me. The family is safe, they're at a neighbor, and their roof had blown off their house. And the children are safe, and your heart bleeds. You can only imagine what they'd gone through. And you want to get to them, but you know you can't yet. You're two and a half miles away in four roads, but you'll get there, but you know they're safe, and that's the good part. Still no way to communicate, and you know that's going to be a long time till you can. You wait a few more hours, and you finally give up. You have to go. You've got to go find them. And there's no way to find out more information, so you finally venture out and you drive over the wires. You, you manage to get to the road and you see a vehicle or two out ahead of you that have blown tires, having driven over live wires. But you continue to try and you get to the edge of the road that leads to theirs and realize that the live wires are now at the windshield height Then you don't dare go further because you're in puddles that are now up and, 
at the bottom of your car so you turn back and you try a different way and a different way. And you're going by that eight-story bank building that has most of their windows missing. And you go near the edge of their, their street that goes up the other direction to, the, uh, to their neighborhood. And you're having trouble finding it because the building at the end of it is gone. No rubble. It's gone. And you're trying to figure out where the end of the street is. And realize if you turn down it that there's water that's now higher than your car. And it's not storm surge. That's water from the, the rain itself. So you're finally forced to turn back and, and find a way to get home. And all the buildings in that two and a half miles that you passed are damaged. And the apartments that you passed, there's literally walls missing from it. And there's very few roofs that are left. And if they are, they're severely damaged and many windows gone. And you go home and the darkness sets in. And you see that your neighbors are okay in your complex. Many cars damaged, many cars deep in water around you. Fortunately, yours was good enough to drive. And you're feeling the heartbreak, but you know that at least people are safe and God took care of the humans. Even then you can rebuild over time. And you're feeling heartbreak and you're feeling anger and you're feeling the things you emotionally go through. And that's normal. And you're starting to meet the people around you. And I met the young guy right next door, a 20 year old, and I get to know him. And a couple months earlier, he'd gone through a divorce and his wife grabbed the child and took the child to Guam. And your heart feels for him. And we're going around to the neighbors and making sure they're okay. And we're lifting trees off of their cars and, and doing the things we can do. And, uh, and got to know him pretty well. And, and we were talking about God and how lucky we were. And, and he told me he was pretty, pretty well done with God. But, you know, we kept going. And he had a big heart. I knew that, that God was in him. But probably not coming out through his brain and that's okay we'll you know we'll find a ways over time and I dealt with them best I could and we we bonded we we did well and I got to know him over the next couple of days and I'll come back to him a little later um, so the night go, goes by and I'm still very concerned about my family and, and uh, again this is not about me and my family this I'm painting the picture for a reason the night goes by and in the next morning uh, I venture back out in the car there's a few more cars on the road and finally, I find a way to get into the other end of my son's street. There's still trees all over it. And by the way, there's, there's wires wrapped through the trees. So everyone you come upon, you take a risk of what you're doing. And I finally found a way to move one of the trees far enough I could get a car at least through part of the end of his street. And my wife is with me on this one. And we jump out of the car and we find the neighbor's house where he happens to be. And we, we hug and we cry and, and weep. And we finally see this house where a third of the the roof is gone and we find out they were in a hallway in a closet and the, the children were okay and they were okay emotionally they were they were shocked but they were they were all right and and the, the daughter-in-law she was certainly in tears and my son was was doing the best to hold it together and keep the family well and we found out that the ceiling above them had held intact thank you god uh, and the kids did not witness the removal of the roof and that was good but the insulation had asbestos in it and it had covered most of what they owned. So all they got out of the house with was the clothes on their back. So they've lost everything. We took them back to our apartment and that was good. They're safe and they're, they're okay. And we're back in the apartment and eventually over the next day we find out through uh, people that we knew in the apartment that instead of the few days it might take or the week or so it might take to get electricity and water back, that the substations had been destroyed and it will now be two to four months before we get electricity back. Has anybody heard that here yet? No. I wonder why. And I'm not, I'm not blaming the politicians. I'm not blaming anybody else. But think about the looters that will hear that story and what they might do. Think about the panic that will set in for the 100,000 people that are left in the homes that have holes in their roofs and windows that are gone and the insects that will infest this. And this is why where the story changes from me and my family to why I'm here today. There's 100,000 people up there that haven't heard this story yet. I was fortunate enough to have heard it and to get my family out. We drove over places we probably shouldn't have even attempted to drive to get out of that community. And I have my family and my wife to safety. And Jack called me yesterday and said, look, I'd like to help your family. I said, Jack, there's a much bigger story to tell here. There's a much bigger human tragedy that's coming our way. And we heard that there'd be no plumbing 
for two to four months, and there's elderly people that are there that are running out of oxygen. There's children there that will run out of food and, and diapers and all the things that will keep them healthy. There's bugs and critters running into buildings that have no way to cover windows and, and holes and roofs that are happening right now. And yes, there's help coming from all over the country. There's charity coming from everywhere, but it needs to come fast and furious. And the story needs to be told. And it can't be told too quick because looters will come in there. And, and nefarious people will certainly take advantage of the situation. But it needs to be done, and it needs to be done smartly and wisely. There are people in this room who are contractors. Find some way to teach the people up there how to look out for, for crime, for, for people that will come in and take advantage of the situation. Find ways to cover those holes and windows quickly to prevent permanent damage to what can be resurrected. The businesses that are there will be damaged, and I know business well enough. I'm a businessman and have been for, for almost 50 years. The, unfortunately, the businesses will move out and the jobs will be lost. And we need to save some of those people. We need to help the elderly. I drove past a nursing home the day of the storm, and there were people pulling the, the residents out of that home that were not qualified to do it, putting them in vehicles that were not prepared to handle them, but they had to do it because they were having a crisis. Now let me come back to the youth, the, the gentleman that was helping, the 20-year-old that was, was having a problem. The last night we were there, he was drinking rather heavily. He was helping his grandmother that lived in the apartment, even though he himself was going for a life crisis. One o'clock in the morning, we heard what we thought was a gunshot. Unfortunately, uh, my son and daughter-in-law heard the gunshot too, and they came to me and they said, was that a gun? And I said, no, I think that was a tree that snapped. They were already dealing with tragedy beyond imagination. I'm trying to divert, and I'm sorry, but it may not have been the right thing to do. But I didn't want the kids witnessing a murder-suicide or whatever it turns out to be. So I tried to divert. And I'm trying to deal with this too, because I liked the kid and I was trying to save a soul. His grandmother was on oxygen and she was a, uh, a, a Christian. And uh, my guess is she was trying to save his soul too, and who knows what happened. And I certainly didn't want to prevent us from being able to leave to find out what happened within that apartment the next morning. So we left, and I talked to people across the hall from us and said, please call the, the police as soon, or get a hold of the police as soon as you can and try to get in that apartment, because I suspect what happened happened, because he didn't bring the dog the way out the next morning the way I always met him. We have to deal with this, folks, and that was a two-day reaction to a crisis. Imagine what people are going to be feeling after a week or two when they thought they'd be out of the problem. We need to get help there, and we need to get help there quickly. Please, close your eyes. Think of what people will do over the next weeks as they realize that what they own is gone, and the houses that they wanted to save will probably be unsavable, because those holes in the roofs will cause mildew and damage that will not be able to be, to be fixed. That all these treasures that they have from their ancestors that they'd saved and cherished will be gone that everything that they owned will probably be lost and their insurance will not cover some of it that can't be replaced. So I'm here asking not for me, but for those people. Dig deep. If you can give money, God bless you. If you can give time, that's great too. At the very least, pray and pray hard. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. That's... What Mike wanted to do what Mike wanted to do was help. And I said, Mike, that you could go volunteer, you could do a lot of things, but if you could help us be motivated to make a difference. And so he's been here all day to, to help us decide to make a difference. Uh, first, I want to pray, and then I want to talk about what we're going to do. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for Mike and Mary's safety and Thank you for Jessica and Andrew and the kids. Thank you that they got out and they're here. Lord, we're gonna do what we can for them and, and to love them and to welcome them back home here. Lord, thank you, for, thank you for the love you've already poured into volunteers' hearts to help and to help each other. And Lord, we pray that 
life after life after life is saved through volunteers whose hearts are right and who help in there. And Lord, get us in there as quick as you can to make a real difference. We pray for every person going through everything from mosquitoes to death. We ask for your comfort, your guidance, and your strength to be with them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. So what are we going to do? One, you have special offering envelopes. Some of you, some of testing. You have special offering envelopes. Some of you already found them, and um, uh, find one of those and take it home and pray over it. Um, first thing we can do is we can, over the next two or three weeks, we can decide what each of us can give and how we can. If you don't have that, if you don't have. Um, the, some money with you. And you may not be prepared to give at the level you could if you pray about it and think about it. Take that envelope home, put it on your table and think through what you could do to make a difference. One. Two. The United Methodist Church is different than all other churches and um, missions. The United Methodist Church keeps a reserve and we pour out a 100% of what you give. When we send it there, 100% goes there because we handle all the administration, we handle all the offices, all the staff, so that if you give a dollar, a dollar goes to Panama City. Now we're gonna send some of this special offering immediately out there. We're gonna help some families we know that are there. And my friends, we're gonna equip volunteer teams. But what I want you to hear about the Methodist Church is we get in and we're first in. And we're first in with water and with batteries and with tarps to make a difference. First from our first, what I call first responders, these are trained first responders and they'll be going in as soon as the area opens up. Then the next thing we'll be doing is we'll be organizing teams. Uh, able-bodied people to go. We typically do two things. We typically take Sawzall and cut out drywall and then bleach spray and we spray all the, all the walls that got wet. And the other thing we do is we take tarps and we cover roofs and we, we make a real difference. That's, uh, that's our hands-on. So we give, our Methodist church gets there quick and then we organize teams to make a difference in our lives. Now, of course we wanna pray for the people going through this trauma. I wanna tell you that when you see trauma and you hear all week about people going through trauma, it brings up the trauma that you're going through too. Because many of us are going through trauma right now. And when we see trauma, it brings up the trauma in our own lives. We know the scripture says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for why? Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen to this assurance from God. When you pass through the waters, this was the scripture for today. This is the scripture, seven weeks. The music was planned almost two months ago. The magazines that, that announced all these subjects were for this day. This is the scripture for this day. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flames shall not consume you. My friends, Christians seek all through their lives to draw upon a power greater than themselves, to rise in the moment of tragedy to faith. Now the philosophers of old 
have a way to get through it, and that's the shallow end of the pool. Let me lift up the shallow end of the pool first. Seneca. Um, we suffer more than actually happens. Our imagination suffers more. My friends, we can take what's going on in our lives and we can explode it bigger and bigger and bigger. We are our own worst enemies when it comes to dealing with the tragedy that actually happens. Listen to Epsidius. It is not the thing itself that upsets us, it is our opinion about that thing. Our decisions about what has happened. Our decisions can skew us one way or the other. I love Amy Grant's song. Um, I don't know if you remember Amy Grant. She was uh, a great singer years ago. Uh, Google moved on. Hmm. Wait a minute. I got to deal with Google for a minute. You know what my wife does when I, when I do this? She pulls out her paper notes. She drops them on the ground. She picks them up and goes, look, they still work. <laughs> yeah, I know. You guys are big fans of sharing cynicism. Um, the same sun that melts the wax can harden clay. And the same rain that drowns the rat can grow the grain and the mighty wind that knocks us down if we lean into it will drive our fears away. My friends, we have a decision in times of trouble. We have a decision to make and it's a faith decision. Does this destroy me? Or does it make me harder? Uh, Jeremy's wife, Kim, sang a song that was just so, ama sang a song that, that just so amazed me. Um, if the storm gets bigger, we sing louder. That was an amazing song. She sang it today. Uh, my daughter sang a song over there with Kim. Um, Lord, keep my head above water. Don't let this drown me. So I want to go from humanism to pure Christianity. Humanism says you have a decision to make. Is this going to destroy you or is it going to guts you up? But my friends, Christians go one level deeper. We go one level deeper than I can guts up and this can make me stronger. And Nietzsche, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. We Christians go one level up. We trust in a God who will not leave us comfortless. We trust in a God, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. We do not suffer alone. We do not find our faith alone. We do not make decisions to be made harder and stronger by this alone. There is a God who will not leave you in your trouble. There is a God who will not leave Panama City, who will not leave Mexico Beach. God will work through hands and hearts, including ours, and we'll get up there with cutters, insect repellent, and chainsaws, and sawzalls, and tarps. We'll get up there with a special offering that you'll bring. But God will also work in the hearts and minds of those people. Because good people do three things. One, good people do for others in times of trouble. When strong Christians face times of trouble, they look around. What happened with Mike? Face times of trouble, what was his first response? I gotta get to my kids and grandkids. His first response in trouble, I gotta find my kids, I gotta find my grandkids. Good Christians get up out of themselves in trouble and help others. Two, two, good Christians find a God that will not let them go and believe in scripture. Let me read it for you again. 
When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. Listen to that powerful statement from God. If you're going through trouble, listen to that powerful statement. This water will not overwhelm you. The third point I want to make through the closing hymn, because uh, Jay's picked an amazing closing hymn. There he is. Picked, I can't find anybody today. Jay's picked an amazing closing hymn. Let's sing it together, and then my third point will be made through our singing. Jeremy, what's the number of the hymn? That's still point two. Point one, good Christians in times of trouble look around for who they can help. Point two, God will never forsake you and good Christians hang on to that like an anchor through every storm. But what is point three? The hymn said it better than I could. New Christians don't get this. It takes growing and growing in grace and knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus Christ to get this. The third verse, when through the deep waters I cause thee to go, the rivers of woe shall not thee overflow, for I will be with thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. You see, what God does is take your deepest woes, your deepest sorrows, your deepest pains, your deepest troubles, and fills the empty void with faith such that the more trouble you go through, the emptier you are carved, the more you are filled with a faith that brings resilience that cannot be overcome. Till in the end, as you approach mature Christianity, as you grow in grace and knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a faith in you carved so deep and hollow, filled so full with living water that life nor death nor power 
powers, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor anything else in all creation will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, and you can die with a smile on your face. You can live and suffer with a smile on your face. As Leonardo da Vinci said, I admire those who can smile in adversity. Their faith amazes me. Be amazed by your faith. Grow into the kind of Christian you can hardly imagine being so that when your death happens, it's nothing. You faced worse. God bless you and go in peace.